You're listening to Earnestly Speaking, the only weekly podcast that covers friends, foes, and anything that goes. And now, for your badass host, Ernest Owens. And we're back for a special edition of Earnestly Speaking with your host, Ernest Owens, myself. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, this is a special edition of this podcast, and I'm a man of my word, and I do promise things, but I am happy that I was able to make my promise on time. Um, You know, for several weeks, I have been hinting at a big story um, that I've been working on for a while, and the time has come. The day is here. If you've been living under a rock, um, you won't know, but clearly you haven't, so you all know what the big story is, which is this big, you know cover story that I was a part of for New York Magazine that has been exploring um, 10 years of the Black Lives Matter movement, which in this piece starts in 2012 with the death of Trayvon Martin in February 2012 to now, which is February 2022. So much has happened over those past 10 years. And New York Magazine wanted to do a a commemorative 10-year anniversary of the movement um, with various writers that are talking about a decade of the movement in different ways. Um, There's a a great story about Trayvon Martin's mother, Sabrina Fulton, um, that is is touching. There has been other people who have written some great work. Raquel Willis, who I know very well, an incredible black trans journalist, uh, talked about, you know, what it means for black trans women specifically to be left out of the movement and what that erasure has felt like in certain ways. Um, there's been stories about the finances of Black Lives Matter. And then there's my piece, which has been really doing well on the charts, uh, talking about the rise and rupture of Campaign Zero, which is not Black Lives Matter Network, let's be clear, but is a police reform um, organization that definitely has had a rupture since three out of four of its co-founders has, has left, only leaving one. And we're here tonight to talk to this very great special guest. You all know I don't really do special guests that often on my show. You know, I'm like J. Cole, no features. But in this case, I really thought that it, there was no way I could do this episode and discuss this this story without someone who was as pivotal to it. Um, you know, when I bring special guests, it, it's someone who got to be really special. Um, you know, last time I had a special guest on this podcast, it was, um, well, my best DJ Marcus, right? But that person is special to me. But the last major special guest I had was Angela the Kitchenista Davis, who you all had wanted to hear from because after several weeks of following the Darius Crooks saga, it just was a, a, a godsend that she agreed to come on and really give us the lowdown of what was happening. Well, uh, I, I felt like it was such an honor and privilege to have Janetta Elsie, who was a protester at Ferguson, um, is the co-founder of Campaign Zero. She has since left. And if you've been following the story, you know that she's had a lot to say since. And I just thought that it was great to have her as a special guest. So without further ado, welcome, Janetta. Uh, thank you for coming on my podcast as a special guest. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Ernest. It's been a week. It's been a month. It's been a year. It's been a year for you. It's been a week. It's Monday. It is Monday, right? I said it's been a week. It has been Monday. You're right. It's it's the day. Today the story it came out. Like a week. No lie. It felt like a week. That's true. It's it, the story has come out and people are talking about it. Um, the internet has been um, just having. This has been a lot, you know. And I mean. I don't know where to start. Let, let's start from the, let's just start with today. <laughs> How has it been today? Um, just with your phone. When did you get up this morning? How did you hear about <laughs> it? W- what's going on? Um, so I think I was up at like seven. Um, I usually get up early anyway. So I was just up and just waiting to see something like Somebody going to send me something, um, whether it's a DM, a text, I don't know. But it was almost like first day of school jitters. I'm just like, ooh, what's, when is it going to drop? Um, but turns out it already dropped at 6 a.m. I just didn't go to the website for whatever reason. <laughs> um, whew, 
and then it was just friends wanting to see the article who knew that it was coming um, and were just interested to see what the final product looked like. And then uh, Sam and I were obviously very interested to see what was going to be written, what quotes were kept, what got scrapped. Um, trying to think, there's a lot of mutuals in between um, all parties who reached out. And I was just like, I didn't know you still had my number. That's crazy. Um, and then actually not too much rotten feedback. So I was right. like, okay, cool. Like today was a, a cool day for the internet. Um, it's also my mom's eighth anniversary of her passing. Mm. So I was just in a different headspace anyway. Um, so all of this has just been... I don't believe in coincidences. So I've just been taking it all in. Wow. And your mother passed away the year that Ferguson happened in 2014. Right. My mom passed um, January 13, January 31st, 2014. Um, my really good friend, Stefan Avery Hart, was shot and killed by the St. Louis City Police two weeks later and then mike brown was killed in august 2014. wow and so it's been wow it's been it's been eight years all of this eight long years yes i also looked up the number eight today i don't know if you're into numerology at all i'm into um, seven because i know seven is completion and that is uh my the, my anniversary um Seven is a big number. Seven was the year that was the end of my favorite when I came out. Huh? I said seven is my favorite number. So oh, I one of, yeah, it's my favorite year number. Year seven was going to be, yeah. like, I thought year seven was going to give me what year eight is, but no, year eight is the number. Interesting. So what is, so what does eight symbolize this? It's authority, self-confidence, inner strength, inner wisdom, um, a lot of talk of, like, power and strength. And just uh, being balanced in oneself. Well, that's great. My eighth anniversary um, is in February, so that's yes. good enough. <laughs> Everybody serves this good number eight, I guess. My goodness. Yeah, yeah. So I'm excited about the number eight. The number eight seems to be uh, getting to some straightening. So I'm I agree. Today. Yeah. So for people who don't know what the story is, if you haven't read it, which I don't understand how you could have not read it, because links are in bios. <laughs> But uh, the story is on uh, nymag.com. And pretty much this story starts in 2014. And we wanted people to know from the very beginning, and what I, what I wanted people to know in writing this, is that Janetta wanted you to know that she, not D-Ray McKesson, was there first. Um, in 2014, you know, Ferguson happened, right? Mike Brown was found dead by a police officer who, in my opinion, murdered him. Um, this happened in August of 2014. Janetta was there in Ferguson. She's from St. Louis, Missouri, which is not that far from Ferguson. She and others saw it, tweeted it. A couple of days later, a bunch of other people came that wasn't from the area. Movement was happening. She's doing her thing. And then a woman named Brittany Packnett Cunningham, which at that time was just Brittany Packnett, but she's now Brittany Packnett Cunningham, who is from St. Louis, was at Teach for America, um, knew of a man named D-Ray McKesson, who was coming from Minneapolis, that's originally from Baltimore, gets there, Brittany tells Janetta about this man named D-Ray, they link up. A couple of weeks, months pass, a newsletter happens. Next thing you know, an organization forms called We the Protesters, which then births an organization called Campaign Zero, which has become one of the most known police reform organizations of our current generation. Um, the organization is now worth over $40 million. Um, and it had that kind of money when it first started. People were not getting paid. Folks was doing the work. But in this situation, the you know, a man named Sam gets in the picture, it becomes Sam, Janetta, 
D-Ray, Brittany. The four of them, right? The Fantastic Four, I guess at one point, um, co-found. Mm -mm. um, <laughs> <laughs> you don't think they were fantastic? Uh, Y'all were fantastic? Oof. No? Oh, was that a real question? I was asking. Did you not think y'all were fantastic? <laughs> no, no. 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 Why? No. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. <laughs> but you all start, you know, Campaign Zero. It's about police reform. It's not the same as the Black Lives Matter Network. One of the things that, that was not in the story, but I think everyone kind of agreed. Brittany Packnett coming in here did not speak to me um, for this story on record, just for clarity. We didn't speak. She's the only co-founder that did not speak to me on record. Uh, Janetta did. Sam did. D-Ray did, begrudgingly. But no one else. She did. We did not hear from her. Um, she. Well, she. Oh, we, did. we did hear from her. Did you say begrudgingly? Good begrudgingly. Night. I. I think that he didn't know. He didn't want to talk to me. Um, no. And 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 there's been some subtweets and some stuff on the internet. You know, it is what it is. Look, I do my job. I'm just here to tell the facts give people a platform to share their truths and, and and do what I do. But you know, it's 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 it is what it is. But um <laughs> three of them spoke to me on record um uh, for this story and what they all agreed on was that they were not a part of Black Lives Matter network. A lot of people during that time um, kind of conflated everybody, and this well, there was not enough room in like all these thousands of words I had to talk a little bit about that. But what is the distinction between Black Lives Matter Network and Campaign Zero, or you know any of it? Because everyone always wants to use it and think it's all these organizations. But I wanted to ask you in your own words: What is? Why are you not a member of Black Lives Matter Network? Never have, never been. You know, people always, you know, just kind of conflate Black people, and I just thought it was important to you know set that record straight before we get to everything else? Ah, uh, oh. <laughs> um, mm, what's the nice way? I don't even... <laughs> well, what's the honest way? <laughs> oh, ooh, ooh, okay. Uh, when I first was approached by BLM in 2014, uh, it was Patrice and Alicia. Um... I just didn't like their vibe, to be honest. I just, just something about them. I was just like, hmm, it feels kind of sinister. I don't know what's going on here. And then um, I could tell we were being targeted. It felt like we were definitely being like picked out of a group of people. Like they knew who to come talk to. Mm -hmm. So that was always just like a, mm, like I could hear like alarm bells ringing, like, and that's not to say I didn't hear alarm bells ringing when I met other other people, but right. definitely with these two, I was just like, something is not right. And then um, they promised us, they took us to lunch in the loop, um, probably in the first month of protest. And there was just lots of talk of like, oh, we could do press tours and we can go on um, media rounds and we'll have resources for you and you could get X amount of dollars. And everyone was like, where are these dollars coming from? And there was never a straight answer whatsoever. It was just, we want to support, we want to help, we want to build. Who was telling you this um, again? Uh, Patrice and Alicia. Oh, and Alicia it was just Garza weird. And Patrice, like, uh, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. And I was just like, but who knows y'all? Like, you have no reason to come down here and say you want to do all of this, um, especially when so much is happening right now. Uh, and then I remember the early days, like they would be watching us get our ass kicked on live streams because there were live streamers back then. There wasn't a Periscope or Zoom or yeah. um, Instagram Live or anything. So it was just the live streams. Shout out to them. Um, and they would watch us get our asses beat and then their media and comms teams and firms would have them booked on CNN the next day, you know? So it was just like, uh-uh. So it was just like, okay, well, I'm so done with this they hashtag. Out there? They weren't like out there engaging in the ways that you all were? No, not during the day, not during the nighttime hours, especially. And they were only there for like three or four days. So it wasn't a whole bunch for them to get off into anyway. Um. Hmm. So yeah, they were just kind of missing in action, and then it was just a lot of talk of hopes and promises, and then we'd see them on the news, and then they would they just disappeared from the city. 
Patrice mentioned you in that Black Lives Matter book that became a New York Times bestseller. Um, <laughs> I know. What, what, you know, she, and she describes a very different situation between you two. I barely even remember that book. Um, but oh. yeah, it was something like she, I, I don't even remember what she described, honestly. Um, but like, I've never had that lady's phone number. Um, we've spoken, we've, we've sent several emails, a lot of emails, maybe like four or five years ago where I was demanding her to make it clear that BLM, the organization is not the same as the movement, is not the same as the network. Um, but that clarification never came because they wanted that muddy uh, definition to exist in order for them to exist, you know. So, no, uh, it was never hunky dory. I don't, I don't care for those, those, those three right there. I'm not even gonna hold you. Yeah, and and I think what's interesting about this is that during this time, there there are more people coming out more. Um, whether on Twitter or other places. That... Eight years later, yes. <laughs> what? <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> Just clarify. Because uh, when we were saying things back then, people just assumed we were, and we as in like myself and the other Ferguson folks who were actually active on Twitter, a lot of people were active on Facebook or on Instagram, mm -hmm. but there was like just a, a subsection of us that were active on Twitter. When we would say things, people would say, oh, y'all are jealous. You're being haters. Yeah, I, get, um, I hear that a lot. Yeah, and it was just like, or we're telling the truth. Like, this shit really happened. Like, they really came here with the firm and a comms team and posted up. We have no reason to like them. Um, and so now, like, seeing all the stories that come out, have come out over the last eight years, I'm just been like, I, I was called a hater for this shit, but okay, yeah, I support you, sure. <laughs> so you're saying the table's turned. I, I, I can relate. I think there was a time where myself and even other people, especially Black women on Twitter, who were very critical of Sean King. And at that time, oh, yeah, I got called a hater for that one too. Got called a hater, right? Got called all kind of things. I when I was very outspoken about him, and I feel like now, right, there has been a tide. You know, there has been a certain. I mean, he still has his cult following, but it's not the same glossy, over the top celebrity adulation that he used to get at some point. I mean, this guy. Speaking of births and things, Rihanna you know, announced her uh, baby with ASAP. She's pregnant. Rihanna gave him this award a, a while back. And I was like, wow. But like, that's not happening for Sean King. I mean, he was getting a BT awards, all this stuff. You don't see that kind of attention to him anymore. Now I think it's very, it's very um, safe to say that you have concerns about him and that you don't want to be around him now. You said that mm -hmm. five years ago and people were like, oh, you're hating on this black man. When a mm. lot of those things may not be true, what I just said in that sentence, but a lot of people <laughs> had that critique, and um, now we're looking at a new situation um, since. So just happy that you cleared that up for folks, because I know sometimes there has been a lot of conflation. Um, you know, it was no, very important for me, and there still is conflation. You know, as long as lazy journalism exists, but I feel like I've always flown on the record to say I'm not a part of that. You're not part of BLM Network. No. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Right. And I know that. I mean, I know there has been distinctions. Uh, one of the things that we talked about that came out of the story was about the distinctions, right? There's Black Lives Matter Network, which is led, which was Alicia Garcia, Patrice, Opal, you know, that was their founding. Then there's the Movement for Black Lives, which includes Black Lives Matter Network. It also includes other groups and they have an abolitionist platform. Then there's Campaign Zero, which has a police reform um, agenda. Then you have Until Freedom, which which is there's Until Freedom. Um, then you have um, other groups that are in between there, right? So mm -hmm. one of the big things that came out was a distinction is that Campaign Zero was not an abolitionist a centered organization you don't identify as an abolitionist in spite of some folks who feel like they think you should 
Um, I remember mm. iconically now, I guess, I asked you, what where are you? And you said you're a realist. Um, mm -hmm. where, what is that? How do, you, how do you explain being a realist in this conversation around police reform, abolition, everything else? Um, I think when I say I'm a realist, I'm just going off of my own personal individual life experience. I don't think all life experiences are the exact same. Right. Obviously not. Um, I have gone through some traumatic events throughout life, some violent traumatic events, um, sexual assault and things of that nature to where I will not prioritize someone else's sexual assault over my own. Mm -hmm. And I don't do that to other people. So I understand when people are saying like violent crimes um, can be rehabilitated. That is their personal belief. My personal belief is I do not see that happening for the individual who raped me. Right. Um, therefore, that has informed my opinion on violent crimes, um, especially where I'm from. <sighs> like we've had plenty of debates about this when I was with Campaign Zero um, about like robberies and, and things of that nature. And I'm just, you know, if you, the scenarios were so off the wall where I was just like, I, you, you're not gonna, you know, mix the combinations around to make me change my mind about certain things. Um, I just don't believe that some behaviors can be fully rehabilitated. And that's just what it is. And I'm okay so with saying you're, like that. That's so we we'll call it like the R. Kelly clause. You don't think R. Kelly can be rehabilitated? No, no, no. Not a, a gigantic sexual predator like that um, over teenage girls and women. And hell, there were some um, teenage boys mm -hmm. in St. Louis mm -hmm. who were saying that he had hit them up. Just all kinds of just wild behaviors that were happening. Um that story was like all over Facebook for a while. So no, like you're untrustworthy. You um, are a danger to society and to vulnerable uh, members of society. And I think he's where he should be. And it took him quite some time to get there. Yes. You know, so that's like, all, that's also the really strange part. Like you watch people say like abolition now, but then you also have people, moments like R. Kelly going to jail and people were rejoicing. Like mm -hmm. I didn't, I don't think I had an outward expression either way. Um, but it is interesting to watch, like how depending on who it is and what they've done, the attitudes change. You know, we talked about that um, in death, and there were some things you said that you do support within the conversation or abolition, but you just yes. was not like. What are some of those things that you you do support within abolition? Oh, like reallocation of funds. I'm all about taking money because police budgets are so huge. Mm -hmm. um, I think of Chicago, New York, um, St. Louis. I say Philadelphia. We got seven hundred twenty-one million dollars in Philly. Right, uh, Maryland, where I'm at right now, the governor has promised a, a few extra bit million to the police, and I was just like, just what? What is this for? When we have not only like people are saying, oh, we could use this money to fund schools and um, get better, better books, better facilities, uh, train teachers, invest in teachers, so you can have healthy, um, healthy classrooms, but we're also still dealing with the pandemic. And I'm just seeing millions of dollars fly to police and police officers and payouts of, of violent crimes by police. So yeah, I definitely agree with a lot of the points for sure. Yeah, and I was I was just thinking like in other terms, like where outside of that, like we are thinking about different relationships and people and, and, and stuff. How you've been engaging other people um, with, with like in Campaign Zero, when Campaign Zero was building traction and support, you know, during that time, it was clear what those distinctions are. Why do you think the public can understand that? Lazy journalism. <laughs> um, 
I say lazy journalism and white people, white people not choosing to make a distinction between black people, which happens all the time about anything. Like it could be damn battle of the bands and they're going to say everyone's an earth, wind and fire fan stan when some people over here are really enjoying the Isley brothers. So, you know, it just depends on whatever your lens is. So if you see a bunch of black people outside, and this has consistently happened over the eight, last eight years, black people go outside, you could be mowing your lawn, suddenly you're a Black Lives Matter protester because you happen to say, hey, what happened to so-and-so down the street was fucked up. And they're like, okay, well, local Black Lives Matter leader. And they're like, mm, or I'm just a concerned citizen mowing my lawn with an opinion, you know? So it's just that not having interest enough in the subject of the story or stories to ask them, how do you self-identify? Like, do you say that you're a part of this or are you just an individual with an opinion? Right. And I think to a certain extent that made that distinction. I think that a lot of people looked at some of the platform agenda ideas that Campaign Zero had in the early years as being more applicable to policy. Um, how would you describe what Campaign Zero was doing compared to what BLM Network was doing or other groups were doing? Because everyone is like, oh, you all are doing the same thing. What made what you all do or the work you all do different? I can't even tell you what they were doing, honestly, because that, that wasn't my business. Mm -hmm. um, what was my business was Campaign Zero, which was, it started out as a 10 point policy plan to end policing. Um, and we created it as an answer to constantly being asked, what is it that you all want? Like, what will it take to get y'all asses out the street is basically what these politicians or local officials were asking us when they ask, you know, what is it that you want? So we first created um, the demands.org, which was actually just a list of all these different cities' demands upon the state or whatever structure or system they're challenging and what changes they would like to see, big or small, concrete or theories, um, just so it could be all in one place. Next, we came up with Campaign Zero, and that's when Sam was also involved and he was doing um, all of these data sets on just getting information from police departments like the police union contracts um, to see what's even, what, what are the numbers? Um, what's allowed, what's not allowed, what language, uh, what problematic ass language exists in these police union contracts? What agreements do police departments have with um, the mayor or the county manager, depending on where a person lives? And just really just combing through all of that and trying to make it accessible to everyday people versus he's a data scientist, he speaks data scientist, and we're doing our best to understand him. So it's kind of, it was just a collaborative effort for us to be like, here are the things that we think work. Um, I do appreciate that over the years, the things that did not work or studies changed or as data changed, some of those boxes were X'd out and we moved away from them and moved on to something else. Um, at least the first year and a half that I was there. Right. And, <laughs> <laughs> right. And during that time, I mean, what was some of the, there was a lot of stuff happening internally. Um, you know, I remember that New York Times story that we do talk about, um, in the piece <laughs> and it was the first big was New York Times. It was a profile of both you and D Ray. Um, and they were talking about movement and I think you was only referenced a small chunk, but there was just a big, huge splash of, of, of chatter about D Ray at the time. And I, as much as I know, I remember you hated it. I mean, I know you've said that on record before <laughs> yeah. that you hate that story. Um, seemed like you was burnt by a lot of journalists in previous years. I was scared to interview, like not scared, but just like, like, damn, I hope that I could change it because I know your 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 previous encounters with a lot of media had not been great in the past. Um, yeah, I think that was just the early years. Though. The early years. Um, yeah. I feel like once I got my own personal straightening about what is and will not be um, and getting the tone 
from the writers themselves. And if I didn't believe it, double check with the editor before participating in a story. Mm-hmm. Um, the New York Times, that New York Times piece definitely taught me a thing or two. Like, this is just not, we're not doing this anymore. And what was wrong with that story for people who don't recall? Um, when oh my gosh, it's just a complete waste of time for me. Um, it was definitely, there's just some things that I'm think, I think, and I'm just like, mm. mm-hmm. <laughs> was that happening at this time in the background? Don't know. But speaking of firms and, you know, having your own media people pitch stories and things like that, I just don't think that that story was supposed to include me. I'll say that. Mm. Um, and it was more like a afterthought, mm. uh, even though my quote was the cover of this fucking story. Um, the photo is wildly unflattering and we took so many pictures and I was like, this is what the hell y'all came up with. But also, I mean, hey, I okay, that's what we want to print. Fine with me. Um, the quotes in there, I, I also barely remember the story because it was just so shitty. Yeah, it was in 2015. But, um, yeah, it just, it didn't, it wasn't giving anything. And I was just like, this is not at all, all these deep ass conversations we're having on drives and long walks. And mm. you're calling me to ask me, well, what's my opinion on this? And I, for me to be a, um, when I did go to school and when I was paying attention in college, it was for my journalism classes. I was just very confused and disappointed by what the New York Times produced as it pertained to me. Mm. It didn't give nearly like, like not one sentence had spice. So I was just very confused. <laughs> like, And compared to this story, I would argue that it definitely is a... Oh, Lord. <laughs> No, yeah, no, nothing, nothing. Uh, maybe the complex. I know complex did a really nice piece. I that remember. I, I saw that a couple of years later. They did. I really appreciated that one. Um, but that was a black a black queer man from um, Kansas City who wrote that. And I just think you know Midwest people we take care of our own in a different way. So. I was born from Chicago, so I'm from the Midwest originally. You know what I'm saying? So Midwest people, think, right? <laughs> right. We, we take care of each other. So I'm yeah. like, okay, cool. I got this. Um, so yeah, that was just in the beginning, mm, very rough. And that's when I started saying no to certain things. And was like, if you do want to talk to me, it's going to be, this is going to be the story. Like, let me tell you, you're not going to play me. And what was the stereotypes? I mean, I think there was always this stereotype about you in the earlier years of the movement and your personality and how it was personified. What was, I mean, was that media alone or, or just that or social media? How, how do you feel about it? Uh, I think I've been a little bit of everything from everybody, honestly. Um, <laughs> if you're not just pro, like she cool, um, or there's like the group of folks who I still majority, I follow majority of the same people I followed before 2014. Mm -hmm. So they've been rooting me on, you know, like just on some like go home girl, like we still see you out here, that's cool. Um, But there's just like a certain little groups of people. I'm probably the worst thing ever. Um, I remember 2014, 2015, a lot of people were like, you're everywhere, you need to sit down, you're taking up a lot of space. And then I remember I did go sit down and literally disappeared from Twitter and Facebook for six months. Mm. And I was well, where are you? And I'm like, well, what is going on? Like, y'all, everyone needs to make up their own mind. Like, y'all trying to find me, figure out where I am. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm offline. So what's the two of you? Um, Personality-wise, I don't know if uh, many people have... I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it, but like geographically, if you've never experienced a St. Louis person, a St. Louis woman, a Midwestern person, um, and all black, these are all just different categories of black. Um, I could be a lot of different things to you. Like I could be unfriendly. I'm not the friendliest person and I've never claimed to be like, I'm not trying to be, um, like I am not 
I'm not, I don't know. I don't know what people thought I was going to be. Also, you know, like people have stereotypes for plus size black women where mm-hmm. you're like supposed to be like motherly or like extra loving and hug people. Like, I don't know, y'all. I'm not hugging nobody I don't want to <laughs> hug. I don't like that. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that I don't like it, but I am respectful. So I remember mm-hmm. I used to always have to like talk about that in the beginning because people were like, well, you're just not nice. And I'm like, that's true. Also, I'm out here fighting the police. Like, what do you think I'm going to do? Like, I'm not the little kid handing water to the police. Like, fuck out of here. So, um, <laughs> but I am respectful. I'm going to remember your name. You speak to me, I speak to you. Um I walk in a room, I'm going to speak because that's how my manners are set up. Same. But it's not going to be, I, I'm not here to like be a cheerleader for friendliness. Like that's just not it. I've also gotten, you know, it's just very strange. I don't know. Uh, Cause I don't think I would even consider these people elite, but elitism around like this space, the movement, political space, it's mm-hmm. just so wild to experience. So I'm just like, everybody seems real regular to me, but okay. Um, but you know, if people have like name brand degrees um, or even just the fact that you finished school, mm-hmm. I got like, she's ghetto. Um she doesn't know how to talk properly. She shouldn't be on TV because she's not like, she's not cute. She's not this. She's not that. I'm like, good guy. Like, what am I? Shit. Right. Um, and, and you was in many ways pushed. I mean, you was in a group before people. It was kind of like a singing group, a band, right? Um, <laughs> in my piece, I, you know, Sam was always the whiz, the tech whiz guy. I always framed him that yeah. way. And, and I saw him that when people, because as he said, yeah, he was a tech guy. He's the data guy, the statistician data scientist, Stanford, you know, all that. Yep. And then you got Brittany, who seemed to be, I mean, at least how she performed, very politically correct, very Olivia Pope-esque energy, um, <laughs> very much like, you know, policy wonk, and 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 all of those things that, right, check off of those boxes. And then you had D-Ray, who seemed to be the very um, poised, tech CEO, modern CEO type, like uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, not in the presentation, <laughs> but in that aura where he could be around guys like that and not be awkward. Um, yeah. And then there was you, right? Who, you know, I many people would say you were definitely not the rest of the three. Um, and no. <laughs> so in many ways, do you feel like people were comparing you to Britney, Britney being compared to you? I mean, did you and Brittany get along at all in Campaign Zero? Oh, we. Um, I think we had friendly, sisterly moments for sure. Um, like we had some fun moments. There were some good advice uh, in the very early stages. Before I just think before all the changes of like ambition and things like that came y'all to talk play. Now? No. Um, no, we do not. <laughs> Have y'all yeah. spoken? I, I, so the only person I talk to, Ernest, is Sam. Okay. okay. Sam is the only person you talk to in the group. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you know, we didn't. I didn't talk to Brittany for the story. So in the story, it says that you and Sam are only ones to talk. But I know people was reading it like, well, what about Brittany? Did y'all all three? Like be like Destiny's Child and just dip the other left, left Farah. Like D Ray be Farah, and then you know the rest of y'all left. Is that that's not what ha- I just want to be clear for the record because some people reading it no. because Brittany they contribute. They no, might look at this as a three group, even though to be mm-hmm. clear, Brittany left before you two left. Even though you left before everybody and then came back, and we'll get to that. But you said earlier about changes that that everything was there was just three vibes and connections and whatnot. And then something changed. I always look at the year of 2016 as a big year. Um, Mm. A lot of things happened in 2016. People ran for mayor in 2016. Um, Mm -hmm. People people got book deals, magazine covers. I mean, the movement became like the Disney Renaissance. Like there was merchandise everywhere. (laughs) 
People was just getting all kind of things. Um, oftentimes, people have, I think, made the mistake, based on my research, of assuming that you, uh, 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 you know, acquired the same level of wealth, attention, and resources and things that D-Ray did because you all were at the same organization. For the record, right. is that true, not true? Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you tell people that. No, not true at all. <laughs> so, you know, they'll say, y'all made millions. Did you make millions? No, I haven't touched even six figures. So, no. And that was something that a lot of people would just assume because they say six figure book deals. You didn't get a six figure book deal. No, I don't have a book deal at all. And mm -hmm. so, when people were putting out that frame, like they were saying, you know, they talk about Patrice and the other ones, Alicia. I always said to people that I don't think everybody involved in the move in the movement, even if they had increased visibility, that visibility didn't hit the same way in value. Like, no. and, and a lot of people frame that like, oh, all of these people. Yeah, they are rich. They all this. They all this. And while I know that in many ways, D-Ray did acquire some some major money. I know, you know, fact checking. We, we did unearth some details. That wasn't the case for yourself. Or even yeah. Sam. I know Sam, you know, shared that, that you know, he wasn't sitting around banking. Um, when you was working for Campaign Zero the first time, was you given a salary? No, none of us were salaried employees at all. Um, we had, like, a minimal amount of funds through, like, selling those goofy T-shirts and shit like that where we would be able to pay for flights um, or if you needed a cheap budget rental for the weekend, that would work like $80, $90. Um, maybe like if I was doing something official, I would buy like a different outfit finally outside of that fucking green coat that everybody saw me in all the time oh, yeah. um <laughs> so, there was a green coat was, and the blue bubble vest right so it was just never no it wasn't popping like that at all um no salary no benefits no health care nothing and and that was your circumstance compared to the fact that blm networking you are, are not the same so whatever they had going right. over there, that didn't trickle down to you. You wasn't in that. Promises no. to give money to chapters, groups and stuff may have been made down the road in the very beginning, but that didn't funnel down there. And that was something that I, I, I thought was important to note because sometimes, you know, in stories, you don't get a, a space to say it, but I think there's always been that impression, um, even though I know that everybody was living differently based on certain circumstances. Um, mm -hmm. In 2016, D-Ray ran for... Uh, Mayor of Baltimore. A lot of people ask, mm -hmm. why did you work on that campaign? In the story, you said it was a disaster. I think a lot <laughs> of people think that looking back in retrospect now, it was kind of weird. But what made you work on the campaign? I think somebody was like, you know, hey, if you thought it was a disaster, you thought it wasn't, what, what made you get involved? And, and what was that experience like? Because he argues in the piece that he had diverse staff and people. And you're saying, no, that's not how I saw it. Or what was that like? Um, I'll just say even the holdup of me even being involved uh, was because of the white people who were in control of the campaign. Um, his campaign manager before the switch was a white person. I don't remember if it was a white man or white woman. I don't recall. But um, most of the major staff was white. Um I don't know if there was even someone who was like a organizer. Here's what we could do to bring the community in person. Um, but that was supposed to be my role. Mm -hmm. And then when I got out there, it was just awkward. Um, I had been to Baltimore before, obviously, but I had not been there and actually interacted with his, who would be the people who would be his constituents. Um, as the person running for mayor of the city. So knocking on those doors and doing just the 
you know, general spiel of like, hey, this is DeRay and he's running for mayor. Want the band? Have you heard of him? It was just so many, no, <laughs> have not. And, and so people you were know, telling you after, that they, they were just like, no, we're mm-hmm. not doing it. No, just some people were just like, no, I've never heard of him. Oh. Um, a lot of people had already had their own, you know, had chosen their um, their candidate and was like, I'm interested in somebody I already know. And that was it. So I was just like, well, all right. Um, it was, I wanted to be involved because I'm thinking at the time, I believe like either that was right before my birthday. So I was 26 about to turn 27 or something like that. Um, I'll just chuck that up to like, we were friends at the time. And while I had my reservations and I definitely told him, um, I don't think that this is a good idea. I don't think it's the right time. That would be my thing. I don't think that it's the right time. I still don't think it was the right time. Um, I think even if he gave it like five years, maybe that would have been a better time just to like be there and have like face-to-face moments with people. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I just think that it was rushed and I didn't understand why that was happening. And then uh, maybe like a month and a half, two months in, I quit. Cause I was just like, oh no, this is actually worse than I even thought. What was (laughs) worse about it, just how bad the reception was to his campaign in Baltimore, or was it just? It was that. It was his attitude. It was the way that um, he was speaking to me, the way he was speaking to other Black women. A, a lot of folks, and they I don't think they would say this. I mean, I don't know if anyone even knows to go find them to say, to ask them, but most people were just like, I don't know who he's talking to. Like, who are you talking to like this? What is going on? Mm-hmm. Um, and that was just always the vibe of like, what, who are you, what on earth? Like, we're doing this as friends um, out of care for our heart because this is what you want to do, but there is no reason for you to talk to me like I'm below earth or anything like that. So I quit. And I was just like, best of luck. And then those damn um, election results came out. And I was just like, what is there to say? They had 3% of the vote. Mm-hmm. I think maybe my, mm-hmm. with all the money he had, you would think he would have a, a, a higher. Yeah. And I still never really knew the um, total amount until actually this article, because you looked it up. But yeah. I had never even done any research to see like just how much money came through that campaign was you getting paid to work the campaign Mm -hmm. i got paid i think just like a flat fee okay um a flat consulting fee and that was it and so you stayed on board with campaign zero so this is why you were still at campaign zero yes and then (laughs) when you quit you, you you know towards the end you left at the end of 2016. You was at the White House. There was a holiday party. Well, I officially resigned um, April of 2017. But you said, but I remember 2016, you knew party. in your heart at that White House holiday party. That picture, which right. has now kind of become <laughs> iconic a little bit. Like now, you know, this picture that accompanies the story is all four of you all together during, I would say, happier times, but behind the scenes it was dysfunction mm-hmm. sam Brittany, you deray y'all are all in that photo it was 2016 the holiday party you was glammed up i was my girl tia really did a bomb job on my makeup she's a um 20 something makeup artist out here in the dmv uh a friend of mine recommended her and she just really glammed me i was like oh my god bella ball it was great. <laughs> and so pretty. when you was in that photo and you took that picture, what was going on behind the scenes? I, you you said it was that <laughs> holiday party that made you feel like that was it. You wasn't going to go. And I know this wasn't the story, but you getting to that party wasn't easy. Oh, yeah, no, no. I think it was just really just, um, it just felt off. Like, this is just not 
we're not gelling well. We're not, we can barely have a conversation um, in person, you know? So I'm just like, we can't do this in person. I don't know how we run a business. Um, I'm also thinking, I don't even think I was supposed to have an invitation to that. Like a friend I had made who worked at the White House, she gave me the damn invitation. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and that's when I decided to go. Um, so, so, so D Ray, Sam, Brittany, all, they was the going. How did, I mean, why didn't D Ray get you? I mean, why did Charles go to group? I don't know. If Sam had an automatic invitation either. Mm. I don't know. Um, but that just started to happen, like, as far as like big meetings with uh, names you can Google. Mm-hmm. It would just suddenly be like, a, something I wasn't supposed to know know about would randomly pop up in my email and I'd be like, oh, okay, this is happening. Um, and they'd be like, yeah, we can do whatever we need to do to get your transportation so you can get here. Or well, who was um, going? If you weren't going, who was going in the group? DeRay and Brady. Okay. So even though it was four co-founders, the same two that was popping up was Brittany and D Ray, and you weren't bringing in. What do you have a thought why that wasn't the case? I mean, you said earlier in the interview, and you've said it before, like that people framed you a certain kind of way, um, stereotypes, things of that nature. Do you think that was driving some of that to say, hey, don't have that black girl at this meeting? Yeah, I think also it was. Um... Again, that ambition factor, right? Because I don't want to be, I wasn't running to be an elected official in my city. I don't want to be the secretary of education. I don't want to be on Obama's task force that is doing nothing. Like I didn't want to do any of that. So So you wasn't thirsty, basically. Basically, it was just like, I want to be in the room so I can say, hey, this is what I know is happening. Um, This is what I've seen. Ask my questions, get my answers, and that's it. Um, But I wasn't there to like rub elbows. Like the DNC, for example, in Philly, I wasn't up late at night to go hobnob with Obama staffers at one, two, three in the morning. I I went to bed, you know, because like I want to be up and ready for the morning for the next activity or the next speech or whatever. Um, so I can go take my notes. Like I was just, I don't know. I'm, I, I really enjoy, um, I guess, the vigorous process of politics and like hearing how all of this shit is actually happening um, that affects where I stayed at. So I want it to be in the mix. Like, I want to know who's saying what, how does this influence policy? Um, Use it as like a learning experience, but I just wasn't there to like hobnob, if that makes sense. Right. And so after that holiday party, you left, what made you leave? Just throw your hands up and say, I'm done. The first time you left Campaign Zero. So this is 2016, 2017. What made you just say, you know what, I'm good. I think my last straw was Sam and I were in talks with some people at Google about like a fund or some funding that they had for organizations like Campaign Zero. I don't remember if it was $20,000 or $50,000, something like that. But we had come up with this whole plan, a proposal. Sam and I wanted to do a tour. Um, where we would talk to people about policy and how policy can be used to enact change. Here's how you can interpret data. Here's what it is in your city. Um, And let's talk about ways you can organize around this information to bring forth some type of change for your, your police department or the state police or whoever it is, like whatever this big thing is that you're trying to tackle. Um, We have all these meetings with the people at Google. They're like, cool, we're gonna give you money. Next thing I know, um, DeRay makes a call and the money is interfered. Um, Sam and I don't hear anything else about it. And just all of that work we did for the proposal 
um, planning who would be there, who would be speakers, who would we bring, who could we have from these cities come talk, all that shit was just gone. Um, and that was it for me. So I was like, okay, I just need to step away from this because now even the money that we're trying to bring in for to do our own thing as the two who don't have all these political ambitions, um, we just want to do our work. We can't even do that because you're making calls to stop things. So, so you're, you're accusing I, him of basically stopping an opportunity that would have improved the work that you all, you felt you all were doing. Yep. And, for, and why would he do that? I mean, get, wouldn't it have that been a good look for Campaign Zero? I mean, with all the movements, there has been criticism of on the, not enough community work, not enough on the ground work. Why Why did he not let y'all have that shine? I mean, why do you feel like that wasn't? I don't really know. I mean, besides what could be obvious thoughts, I don't know. We never really had a long conversation about it. We never had... A conver- I don't think we ever even had a conversation at all. I think at that point I was just done talking. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was, okay, what's my exit strategy? Okay, I want to leave. How do I write a resignation letter that isn't <laughs> uh, just laced with curse words? Like, what? Right. Do- <laughs> how do I write this? Fuck you <laughs> in a way and that- fuck you and fuck you. <laughs> Sincerely, yeah, like, how fuck do I write you, this? Right? No. Um, eloquent and actually expresses how I feel about the positives about what we've done together. And that's what I came up with. Mm-hmm. But I was like, I just need to take some time before everything is just a literal, like, fuck you and fuck this and losing my mind all over the place. I didn't want to do that. Um, and so that's what I was able to come up with. And I believe I resigned. It was like April 4th, 2017. Hmm. So then I disappear. So I don't know anything that's campaign zero related until 2020. Yes, the world changed. You right. know, <laughs> the world changed, right? So we fast forward. And zzz, zzz, zzz. They didn't have any money in 2017. Zzz, zzz. 2018 didn't have any money. Zzz. 2019 still had no money. Zzz. 2020. 2020, 2020, George Floyd. Mm-hmm. There is you know, eight can't wait. There is some drama with eight can't wait. As you know, there was this, there's some statistics and some information that went out that necessarily didn't have the right context. Sam, the statistician at that time, who was still on board um, during this time, this is around June. This is right before defund. The police had really taken off as the messaging, but people were, were in talks at that time there was conversations about what was the answer. And then A Can't Wait drops, Ariana Grande, Oprah, people are sharing it on social media, people are hyped. But then folks are like, hold up, wait a minute, these numbers ain't adding up. The math isn't math and the context don't make sense. And Sam you know, goes out there and he's very apologetic about it. He says, hey, this is, this rollout was rushed. Uh, Brittany Packnett, now Brittany Packnett Cunningham, she leaves. She sends a long, lengthy explanation on Medium. Um, she didn't talk to me, but she put it all on Medium. Um, at that time, this was 2020. Time has went by. I'm like, I keep thinking 2020 was last year. And like... I know. I was going to say it was 2021. Like, where was I'm 2021? I'm like, what was... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I turned 30 and I got married in 2020. So it's still a special year. But 2020, just like, what the hell? So this campaign gets... And a whole bunch of mess. If you read the article, you could get more into those details. But some things happen. Brittany leaves. Sam mm-hmm. is kind of on the fence, still around. There is now $40 million that has gotten raised during this entire time. Because at that time, white people cared about Black Lives Matter enough to give everybody some money. They cared enough to put their money where their mouth is. Didn't clearly care in 2015, 2016, 2017. You know, clearly y'all weren't getting money. There was no salaries. There were no jobs. All of that. So around this time, D-Ray reaches out to you after Brittany leaves. So at this point, there's no black woman co-founders. You had already left. Brittany had left. Sam was still there and D-Ray was still there, but the women had left. So then he comes back to you. 
what was that like when he reached out to you? What did he say? How was that feeling? What was the vibe? Did you know what was going on at that point? I mean, what was going on? <laughs> well, I mean, I saw all hell break loose, obviously. Right. Um, the whole, I, I think we read, all saw that happen. <laughs> right. I just didn't read all. I think we all saw what was going on, obviously. Um, I did not read everyone's statements in full. It was it was a lot of words. Um, and also, I was just thrown off by the public statements of it all, because I was like, if I wrote a public statement in 2017 when I left, everyone would be up in arms like, Oh God, the 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 tantrums that would have been thrown if I had made public written statements outside of the few tweets that I did say. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was interesting. I also found it to be very very interesting that the people who thought I was a misfit in the organization or just was wrong you know i shouldn't have been there in the first place we're suddenly all fighting online <laughs> just like why are y'all arguing what's going on i thought i was the ghetto one like what's what's this no. um no. and then uh deray and i had already been like communicating we were cool it just was never like i never asked to come back didn't care to come back and didn't care to ever ask about Campaign Zero, because I'm like, that's y'all business. I don't work there. I'm not on any documents. I'm not on no paperwork. That's not, I don't have nothing to do with that. So then all this happens. And one day he were on the phone um, that summer and he's like, what are you doing today? And I was like, oh, I have an interview. And he thought I meant like uh, with a journalist. And I'm like, no, like for a job. Um, With this women's organization I was really excited about. He was like, well, before you do that, could you consider coming back to campaign zero? And I was just like, hmm, can I? I'll think about it. And um, I also was just like, hmm, but what on earth is that mean? But also I was like, mm. I felt like that meme, you know, where that lady is like, eh, mm, mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just, I was like, oh. Because it was also an opportunity to go back and just see what the hell was going on and mm-hmm. to actually, why are y'all fighting? What are you arguing about? What's the problem? Um, what else has been, what has happened since I left? Um, and because I was the only one who's ever resigned and been outside of the sphere of Campaign Zero, I know what Campaign Zero means in the world. So I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll come back. Um, and just see, like, I just want to come be nosy and do my work, but mainly to be nosy. Like, mm-hmm. what if, what if, what have y'all done? Um, so that's what I did. I came back for a contractor for like four or five months. And then I was an official employee for four months before I got and fired. Was the head of your position? Head of community or director of community, something like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically in those first four months, it was almost like being a, a, I was a crisis manager almost like (sighs) trying to understand what the hell even happened with A Can't Wait. Cause again, not my monkey, not my show. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with me. All that fiasco on Twitter. I didn't give a damn because it just didn't have anything to do with me. So I wasn't reading any of it. Most of it was muted. Um, so I was having like peaceful days on Twitter while I was like World War Three bump- jumping off. Um, and then when I came back, we did a few other campaigns. But at first we had to do all of this calm strategy and talking points for what went wrong with A Can't Wait, what went right. And here are the things that actually happened, blah, blah. Hearing Sam's side, hearing DeRay's side, um, trying to form a board. Like it was just so much that still had to happen that had never happened in all the time that I was gone um, that I was very confused. I was like, I thought this was a functioning business. How y'all don't have a board yet? Like, what is, what is this? Um, I just had a lot of questions. And the board starts to come though, right? There begins to be a board. Sam's there, you're there. And the board starts to look very familiar. 
the board right. chairman or chairperson or chairwoman, it was the campaign manager for D Ray's campaign, campaign, uh, for his mayoral campaign. Is it right? So the campaign, the current campaign manager or the current board chairperson chair for campaign e zero was the former campaign manager of D Ray's campaign for mayor. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then there were other people that in the story we said, you know, there were some of D Ray's friends. The boy was being stacked with his friends. D Ray doesn't get into the whole thing about whether it's his friends, but just simply says that you all collectively did um support those people get on the board. But Ooh, let's be clear. Yeah. I said yes because if I know I know if I would have fought him on any of these names. Um, my time would have been limited and I wouldn't have gotten any of the information I was there to get, which is, I want to know what the hell is going on over here. Did you? Um, yeah. And also just knowing that he's going to do what he wants to do anyway. So mm -hmm. it didn't matter if I agreed or disagreed or if we fought about it. Like, so it was just you don't feel like it was a diplomatic process? No. no. You felt like it was pretty much, you weren't being asked, you are being told? Yes. Like, you know, if somebody say, hey, I want this person on my board, what y'all think? You know, normally it's like, a, well, we think this, we think that. And they're like, okay, I hear you. Versus, I want this person on the board. What what y'all got to say? Like, what's the, I mean, what's the energy? <laughs> like, I'm just trying to understand, like, how does that work? Uh, how would you describe it, like, in a position where you felt like, you know? Uh, I'll just say, even with, like, the chair of the board, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because we were all cool. But I knew the minute she became the chair of the board, um, and we had conversations about this. She wrote me a very long text message about this because I was very honest. And I said, the minute you get on that board, you you are the raised friend first. Um, and I'm shit out of luck. Mm. So, and I know that, you know, I was still learning how boards exactly work, but it's also, I know that I need someone on this board who might even seemingly have my back because I, excuse me. Mm -hmm. My God, I oh my God! <laughs> Sorry. Okay. When um when she became when she was elected on, I told her like I know that you will be here to protect his interests first because not only do I know the level of their friendship, I remember the mayoral race, right? So it's just like that's your norm. You're gonna perform how you normally perform, um, and then. It was just also the point of I just know I don't I don't know if you call it manipulation or is it just emotional bonding, but I just know how he can pull you in um to go with whatever his plan is, right? So I'm just like the minute you get on this board and you're the chair of the board, and I'm gonna agree to this shit because I know that there's no stopping what mm -hmm. he wants to happen. Um, I just want you to know that I know that you're not going to have my back or the business's back um, or Sam's back. Like, you're just, you're going to be all about him. And she told me in a very long text message, you know, like, that I'm deeply concerned and this really hurt my feelings today and blah, blah, blah. I was like, ah. it, it might have hurt your feelings, but it was the truth. And then everything that happened after that, I was like, yeah, because I, I know y'all, like, I was not shocked. Um, I got one person on the board. And I also knew that, like, she was a perfect fit for the board for the vibe of what they were all going for. And it was just like, this isn't being a, a team player. It's more like, I'm here for something else. If this is the win I have to concede to keep finding out what the hell is going on over here, I will let this go. Mm. But I did make a few demands, like we had to have executive coaching. Um, and and that was something that came up, you know, that I, it wasn't the story, but everyone had it. And D-Ray, you, yeah. Sam, how was that feeling of, like, what was that like? I mean, executive coaching, bringing that in in the midst of all that drama. So things got so bad that y'all literally had to have coaches communicate through each other. Yes. Um. I mean, I was just grateful that I had friends who helped me even get the language of you needed an executive coach because I'm like we need help we need someone to come in 
or three people to come in or however many people need to be involved. We need somebody, something um, to help, I guess, quell the fire of what's going on in between just the three of us. Mm -hmm. Um, And then in come our executive coaches. I know I work diligently with mine. I know that Sam worked with his. I am not sure what Dre did with his, um, but my coach, she definitely helped me not only understand what was going on in uh, corporate world, explain what the hell all of this meant um, and what it meant for me. And then we also worked on my exit strategy because I'm no fool. I knew that Sam and I were about to be pushed out. Damn. And yeah. you felt that y'all were oh, getting pushed out. Oh, definitely. So I had a team. Um, I had like a team of 10 organizers across the country. And around January or February, I just flat out told them I had calls with all, all four groups and let them know my time here is co- going to be up soon. And I know how these folks are. So when I go, all of y'all are just, you are also gone. And it's not that they're going to give you a call. They're not going to give you a letter. They're just never going to call you again. You know, like there's no meetings to be scheduled. You just probably won't hear from them. So thankfully campaign zero was not their main job or their first job. It was Mm -hmm. like something they were doing on the side, still 40 hours a week. Um, everything was digital, uh, mostly just already work that they were doing anyway. Um, decent pay, but they were contractors, so no no benefits or anything like that. Um, and yeah, sure enough, like two, three months later, I was gone, and so were they. Mm. And, you know, the board says that, you know, according to the Campaign Zero Board of Directors, you know, they said that they let both you and Sam go because you ought to not, you know, you know, do the duties and expectations of the job. And they lay out explicitly in those resignation letters that, you know, of course, I got a chance to look at all of the different things that you ought to show up for and all the absences mm-hmm. and things. How, how do you respond to that? You know, they they make it seem like, look, You didn't do the assignment. You didn't do the job. So that's why you got, you know, fired. How do you respond? Well, for Sam, you can't fire someone who's not really an employee. So explain your bad business practices there, how you fire someone who's not an official employee who never signed any documents. Um, Sam didn't sign an NDA? I'm not going to go too far. No, he didn't sign an NDA, no employment agreement, nothing. Um, I'm not going to go too far into his business. Right. It's his story to tell. Right. But uh, at one point, I was also arguing with the board that we need an HR. What kind of big business like this doesn't have an HR? So they got or, $40 million. They don't got an HR? No human resources whatsoever. So what I was told by several board members is we don't need one because we have a whole host of um, contractors and that's it. And I was just like, if anything, that's why we definitely need one because these folks are not bound by anything. Um, especially with most, most of them giving us the contract to use and, uh, people just signing them, not really reading them. Cause if you did, you know, there's like, so, there's no solid NDA, so no let me nothing. Get this right. uh, do whatever. So let's be clear. Your you didn't HR didn't give you your resignation letter. Who the board did? I mean, Duray did. Duray. Mm-hmm. How did you feel that at one point in time, someone who you met in Ferguson, you became friends with, would soon become your boss, an executive director, somebody who all of this would have probably not happened without your work is now turned around telling you you're fired from the organization that you co-founded. All I hear is Donald Trump. You're fired. Um, (laughs) But it was just very, it was laughable. Um, The typos alone let me know just how angry he was when he was writing that letter Mm. of of termination. I was just like, ooh, I I guess it's supposed to be so spicy. I'm supposed to be upset. You're terminated. But I actually, yeah, I'm fired. Um, But I thought, yeah, it was 
it was laughable to me. Um, and I was just like, you will, you will have all these words back. Like all of these words will find you again. Um, and I just, I didn't internalize any of it. I actually didn't read the termination letter that day because I was out anyway. Um, I had a date. <laughs> and so we oh. went on our date. Oh. We went about our business. Okay. And I read it the next day. And I was just like, oh, okay. Because I knew it was coming. So it was just like, this is not when I started to jump out of my skin about this. Not at all. So you wasn't shook? No. Hmm. And I guess um I also want to say like this is just it was a long time coming. One, I'm just I'm happy that connection is just over. I wanted to know what was going on with this business that you when found you out. Google my name and you Google everybody else's name, all of our names come up together, this business comes up together. I wanted to know why the girls were fighting. Um Shout out to Azalea Banks. The girls are fighting. Right. I was like, why are they fighting? Like, what are y'all doing? So they're, they're fighting now. We people say this article, the girls are fighting now. I don't think this is a damn fight. This shit happened last summer. So I'm just like, it's not a fight. Fights involve emotions. I think this article was just facts only, really. Well, I appreciate um, that. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, he's Yeah, like there's no there's no heat from anything that I read. Nothing that no no heat from what I said because I know spice. And so you didn't let the tro- you didn't let the chop out. You don't think in this? No, not how it could be. Absolutely not. I think it was. Um, <laughs> I think it was fair. Shit. I think it was just like these are the facts. Like this is what happened. Um, no. Nah. We didn't get into the feelings and emotions of things. What did you like, think? He, how did you feel about his response in the article? I mean, everybody, I interviewed everybody. Um, I made it a point not to share or overshare what was said to any of you all during the interview process, what the others said or whatever. I mean, if there were questions I had, I had them, but I didn't really share anything explicitly about what you all said about each other. I kind of interviewed you all individually. And it's interesting because you're like, you know, for me as the reporter and the journalist covering it, I'm sitting here and I have to, you know, keep a straight face. Listen to each of you all share. How did you feel about his responses in the story? I just felt PR perfect. Mm -hmm. Like this is the acceptable answer. If I am going to answer, this is what I'm going to say. That's fine. Uh, I think even with the, these are the perfect answers, I just think there was a whole different route that could have been taken Mm -hmm. Um, instead of just constantly, I've learned, I've learned, I've learned. If you've learned, why do these same problems keep happening, you know, and with multiple people, um, three different co-founders, me twice, why does this keep happening and the common denominator is you? so it's interesting. But also, like, looking back at things, I'm almost 33. All of this shit started when I was 25. Um, mm-hmm. Business was formed when I was 26. Quit his campaign and quit Campaign Zero right before I turned 27. And then for all of this to happen shortly after turning 31, 32, and now being 33, I'm just happy it's over. Um, and I know, like, this is the start of something else. I'm sure that there are, like, investigations to come. The same way BLM, the network, keeps having multiple piece after piece after piece. It might be a little quiet for three weeks and then boom, another story about finances or phantom buildings that aren't actually um, offices, things like that. What do you mean by phantom I, buildings? Explain that to the listeners, phantom buildings. Oh, I saw something about like um, in one of these pieces. I, I forget. Is it the mm-hmm. Washington Examiner? Yeah. Um, where they were saying that like some office building that's listed on one of the um, official documents as an address, the people went to the damn address to go ask some questions, and the person at the the front door is like, "There's never been a BLM office here." So I was like, oh, 
Okay, a ghost site. Okay, cool. Um, (laughs) So it's just like, you know, there was a time where they thought no one would ever question them or look into what they're doing with their finances and money. But the difference here is nobody from BLM executive leadership has ever called into question what they are doing um, on the record. Here, Sam and I are both co-founders of this place. Um, As so recent as last spring, last January, literally a year ago, um, these same people who are now currently trying to figure out how to slander Sam and I were singing our praises on work calls and conferences about, you know, just, oh, the, the, the joy and happiness you bring to the organization because you helped us put out this giant fire. Um, it's never, I've never seen co-founders of a place in this movement space say, hey, something is not the fuck right. And you know, if you're thorough, please come do your due deals and figure out what's going on. Because there's not, you know, we don't know everything about business. I don't know all the ins and outs about boards and transparency and what should and shouldn't be. But I know that some of this shit is just not right. Mm. Mm. And I'm happy I got my answers, even if it took me Eight years to figure out what the hell was going on. I still don't know all the things going on, um, but it's enough for me to be done. And it's enough for me to just, um, I moved I moved on last summer, praise God. Like life changes are happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, like a whole new life is calling me. So I'm happy that we could just put this, for me, put this part to rest and, God gonna handle the rest. That's what I do now. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is that in all of this, you know, what is the advice? You know, it's a lot. I think it's, I mean, just interviewing everybody and all the stuff behind the scenes. I mean, it it was an odyssey going through this. Um I guess people will know why did you talk to me? Because you know, you know, Mr. Conspiracy Theorists and the folks that be on Twitter, the chittery and chattery. What what made you speak to me specifically? I mean, there's other reporters that I mean even writer that even people messaged me was like, why she talk to you? I'm like, Well, because I'm good at what I do, I think. But you know, people ask that because they I've, I've heard from people they like, you don't talk to press. You hadn't talked to press about this. Um we haven't met no, in person. Have, so but also none had reached out. Um, I made my little Twitter thread last, last May. Yeah, you had talked um, about this on Twitter last May. I remember this. When the, um, board was actively trying to push me out, that was my way of trying to give myself some time to at least talk to attorneys and talk to, um, board experts, which I was tweeting and being like, Hey, if you're, if you know about this topic, can you, can we please have a call? Which was so wild. Um, being a part of a place, a place that you create, being a part of a place, a place that you created and not having the resources or not having these people be open and honest to say, this is what we can do. This is what we can't do. Everything felt like a favor. Like I'm doing you a favor by sharing these minutes of the meeting with you. No, you're not. Like this is public information. It should be listed somewhere online. I shouldn't even have to ask, um, let alone, I shouldn't have to ask at all because I can be there. You should be telling me when the schedule for a board meeting even is. Um, so again, you can, you don't know something until you know it. And with a lot, when it came to the board, Sam and I just didn't know. Um, so I made my little thread last summer. And then I just left it alone because I felt like I was talking into the abyss, like the maybe 30, 40 people who were following that thread closely. And then I just like, okay, I'm going to move on to the to the next thing, which is I had to move out of my apartment, couldn't afford it anymore um, and had to move. Um, Had to figure out life, like how do I take care of myself if my funds, my money funny, Mm because I've just been kicked out of my job 
um, for asking questions. Uh, and then I was just like, you know what? Okay. And also just with me, myself, I know how I am when I'm like, you did me wrong. This is wrong. This is not right. But not only did you do me wrong, you did my my organizers wrong. You did my fellow co-founder wrong. You didn't did so many people wrong um, trying to be shysty. And that just wasn't sitting right. And I was like, you just have to let it go. Let it go. So I was like, okay, I'm just done with this shit. I'm going to move as far on as I can. Um, and then boom, one day you email me and you're like, I'm doing this story. There's this 10 year Trayvon. And I, it, when I first, when I read it, I'm like, well, I, I wasn't around, like no one knew of me during that time. So how do I apply? Like, where do we come in? And then when you further explain, like you wanted to talk about the, the campaign zero of it all, it's like, oh, okay. And then boom, it was just like, this is the time. Like this is the time where we can go on the record to talk about what in the fuck just actually happened to us. So I, I agree, but I also asked that you interview Sam because I'm like, he could fill in the blanks um, that I just don't know because I was not there. And I wanted you to get a full picture of what the hell had been going on, not just my side. Yeah, I felt like I did with the best I could. You know, Brittany didn't speak. Um, you know, D-Ray did. You know, we did talk. I did talk to D-Ray extensively. I had talked to all of y'all for several hours. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I think what's important for, for listeners to know and people to know, I'll say from my experience, I did my due diligence. I asked the questions. Um, some people don't know how to answer questions straight up. Some people do. Um, I think some people had different perceptions about what they thought the story was going to be about versus what it became. I try my hardest to be as transparent to people about what I thought was the arc of the story. You know, you never, you know, there, are, there's always this, this is a bad story. This is a good story. This story is a hit piece. I, I know that from <laughs> sources I know, you know, D-Ray has told people that he thinks this is a hit piece on him. And I've been very clear on saying, hey, D-Ray, you are the executive director of a nonprofit that's worth $40 million dollars. If you don't think that people should be able to ask you questions about leadership or issues that has been shaped by that or impacts that, I don't know what to tell you. And so that's the thing. It's just like, what's interesting about this piece is that it's it's critical. Um, it's, it's, you know, some people are used to the glossy, glamorous profiles that, that really only say everything that a you know, press release would say. And in this, th- this is not the type of story that you could just throw in PR statements. This is a story where, you know, stuff is being fleshed out and you got to answer truthfully or answer, you know, be transparent about. I think to me, it's not even about just truthfully, but just being transparent, being very um, honest. And I think you had a lot of vulnerability in the story that, I don't think people had heard from you before in in a in a print piece at least. I think Sam was definitely very much so um expressing a lot of his feelings and I think there was a lot of those things that shaped, you know, how the story came out. So it's going to be a lot, yeah, you know. Definitely, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think you just caught you caught us at the right time. We had both moved on to other things. Right. Um like I just submitted, I know when we first started talking about this, I was saying that, oh, I'm excited about this proposal I got to prepare and um, in this competition. So I actually put that and submitted that today. So I was like, okay, I've checked off all four things that I'm supposed to do on my list today. Um, I'm super excited about it. Even if I don't win and like place in this competition, I'm just excited that I put myself out there Mm -hmm. and one of my brain babies got to be on, on paper. Um, Even if this is not the project we do together, there are two of my amazing friends that I'm just 
so happy that I've met in the last eight years and we work so well together um, that we were able to come up with this concept and do all the editing in time so I could submit it before midnight. I submitted it like four hours ago. Um, so it's just like there's other stuff happening and I know that there's more to come. It's just nice to like you caught us at the right time where we were like, this has already been in our spirits. A lot of people told us not to say anything. Oh, this is a bad look. Um, like you said, people feel like this is a fight. This is not a fight. Um, nothing, nothing about this piece even encompasses the fights that I witnessed when mm -hmm. I came back to Campaign Zero, mm -hmm. which was enough for me to be like, we need help. We need coaches. We need somebody to help us in this moment. Um, so I'm actually really, I'm, I'm, I'm happy of the piece. I'm, I was going to say I'm proud of it. I didn't write it, but I am proud <laughs> well, of what you wrote. You. Thank you. Um, and I'm happy. I don't know. It's just, I don't believe in hap in, in coincidences. I think all of this just came together the way that it was supposed to. It was the right person, the right mag, uh, a magazine with lots of credibility. Um, and I know it wouldn't have been printed if things weren't checked and double checked and fact checked and check, check, check. And on top of that, I sent documents to support what I was saying. So I'm just really happy with what, what this came out to be. It's, it's not a super long read. It's not too short. I think it was just enough. Um, and I, I'm interested to see what else comes from this for sure. Absolutely. Um, me too. You know, I feel like there is, this is not over. Um, I think there is more questions that need answers. I don't know if that's going to be me that's going to get to it. <laughs> but I definitely <laughs> think that there is a new, there's a door that's been opened. There's a breakthrough that's been made. And I think that it's going to be interesting to see, you know? It's so wild. Sam and I both, I was like, I feel free today. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not just talking about campaign zero. It's I'm not stupid. I'm not dumb. I have heard all the things people have always said about my friendship with DeRay, about uh, <sighs> using me and possibly using him and just all people's opinions about us two as a pair um, and what was going on. When there were public rifts, things I've said that got back to him, he definitely asked me, did I say X, Y, Z? And I was super honest and said, absolutely. Yes, I said all of that and meant it. Um, and here's why. And here's how you can improve. Here's how I can be better. Um, and let's try to work on this friendship. But it did not take me long to realize, like, this is not a friendship, actually. Um, and this, I need to, to get the information I want, I'm just going to be here. And Campaign Zero is my business. I was very interested in knowing what the hell was going on over there. I now know, and I can now move on. Like, that question mark in my head is answered. Mm. Um and it's it's nice to be able to affirm Sam, have Sam affirm me, and we're just we're moving on. Mm. On to the next, at least professionally moving on. Now, what happens after this article, though, Ernest? Oh, we, you know, like if there's gonna be some investigations, some deep dives into finances, like has like there's been with Black Lives Matter. I cannot say um, that it wasn't well earned, you know, and that's because of this piece being so well written. Ah, mm, mm, and mm, 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 mm. <laughs> uh, and also shout out to Angela. Like Angela, Angela texts me this morning, and, and we're and we're saying Angela's in the kitchenista, right? Yes, kitchen East. Yeah, you know they. My, you know, good, yeah. my good eerie sister. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just like, we like Ernest and got some folks out the paint. So 
I'm going on Ernest podcast. I haven't done a podcast in months. Um, and people are right. I have not talked to anyone about any of this on the record. I've never even talked um, about DeRay freely about my thoughts because I was just like, they're all over the place. Um, mm-hmm. But now I just feel, you know, things have got to settle. And that's why I'm like, this isn't even, this isn't spicy. There's no emotions attached. It's mm-hmm. just facts. Um, and I think that's the best time to talk, especially as a hot headed Aries. I think it's best for me to like take that time to let things settle so I can truly know how I feel, not just the instant angry that I can sometimes go to. Um, and I think that's just a part of getting older. I agree. I agree. Well, <laughs> I, I definitely think there's there's more. I think that this week is going to be an interesting week. Black History Month kicks off. You know, we're in Black History Month. You know, hey, I think happy Black History Month. I think the Rihanna the Rihanna ASAP announcement got people thinking. But I just feel like there's just so much more. I think there's so much more that's going to unfold. You know, um, there's got to be a conversation. I've just been pushing the story out, letting people just read it. I haven't really gotten a chance to digest it. And I'm in a place it's now. It's a hell of a story. What'd you say? It's a hell of a story. Thank you. I haven't had a chance to just really take this in. New York Magazine keeps tweeting it out there. They want the street, you know, they, you know, they want the people to know. And <laughs> I'm happy they do. You know, I, I I definitely have had to fight to tell this story the way I wanted to tell it, you know? Um, And I got to to tell the story the way I wanted to tell it. You know, I got to interview the people. I got to ask the questions I wanted to ask. I, I got to really keep parts in this story that I felt like was important. Quotes that I felt like need to stay. There were so many people that was interviewed and there was so much stuff that did not make it. But honestly, what made it and what's there is to me the best, right? And I was happy to get a chance to interview you because I wanted to fill in some of the gaps that I felt like, you know, you only get so much in word count. But I felt like it was important given the reaction on social media. I thought it was important to get you to fill in some of those gaps. Cause I think some people may not get all of it and they might think, well, you know, I thought it was good. It's, a I just, fight. it's in fighting. It it's, is. Oh, we shouldn't fight in public. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, always the fighting. we shouldn't fight in public. I'm like, it's is not it fighting. fighting? No. I mean, now D Ray is throwing sub- subliminal jabs to me, but we're not fighting. <laughs> I interviewed him. If he felt any of those things he felt, he could have said it in the interview. He did not at all. He kept it very cute. What he did out, outside of the interview, that's different. But what we did in the interview, it was very respectful. It was deep. And at the end of the day, you know, people got to keep a certain reputation and face outwardly that they don't necessarily align with or match you know, I give everybody a platform, my opportunity to share their truth. Some people will share more than others, but then they you gotta live with it, right? So mm-hmm. here we are. So any last thoughts? Yeah, any well, last things you wanna advice. say? Any advice? Any last thoughts you wanna tell people? Advice you wanna give people? Anything? <laughs> Uh, I think maybe some some people have wondered, like, even if I'm so outwardly spoken, if I've been so outwardly expressive of BLM, why did it take me so long to say something about DeRay? Mm. Um, mm. Again, good, it was just good, more unfinished business. Um, I think, in the, in the words of my friend Steve, I was straightening is really just the the word that comes to mind. Like I left campaign zero because of bad business willingly the first time, the second time fired. And I got to see what he is like in action as an executive director, what this board is really like. Um, 
because I was actually on the board, the first iteration of the board, I was on that. And I resigned from that too, when I resigned from Campaign Zero in 2017. So it's just a lot of unanswered questions that I had that grown me, knew I needed to go back and, and fill in those gaps for myself, just out of pure curiosity of, well, what the hell did I attach my name to? Um, and just to get proof, evidence, like there's, of course, people can talk and I'm not blank. Um, I have read and seen and heard everything. Um, but again, it was just like, we need proof. Like you can't just go say things about people and that be just the fact without having like substantial things in writing, um, seeing uh, patterns, uh, having patterns to prove to someone like a Ernest at a New York magazine that this is what happened to us. Um, so I'm happy I stuck and stayed the course um, and came out with minimal bruising, came out much stronger and wiser, um, sharpened more business um more business skills than when i came back to campaign zero um and also my mother owned a business and operated a business with my family when i was growing up so i know good business when i see it um so i was just very interested in how the hell is this being ran and so i'm glad i got all of my answers Absolutely. Wow. And I couldn't get those answers from the outside. No, so. clearly not. <laughs> no, no, I, I couldn't have gotten them either. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm not heard about it at y'all all. Y'all were a very um, tight group. I must say, y'all kept it looking good on the outside versus the inside compared to others. Oh, yeah. Anybody finna act ugly in public? Yeah, I will um, say that even I, now I still don't think we're acting ugly in public. No, y'all um, have kept it very cute on social. There hasn't been mm-hmm. any. Mm-mm. No, it's been you know maybe D Ray doesn't want that smoke. There's no smoke to be given. You know, there's no smoke mm-hmm. when there's just facts. It's just facts. Now, if it's smoke, especially now, I have a partner. I don't oh, so you're not you're not single. Said, no, no. The streets, okay. I, you know, because you know when you get a new stories, people start being like, "Well, it's been a I minute since I've seen her." You know, <laughs> it's one of the happiest situations I've ever been in mm. my life. So I'm just—I think that's another reason why everything's just so grounded right now. Like, I'm chilling, and we're not gonna let nothing disrupt the peace in our household. So I can't. It ain't gonna be no smoke. <laughs> right. There's something residual you, smoke is real. There's something you said. Right. There's something you said earlier that you said is that justice is peace. Yes, indeed. What you mean by that? Mm. Well, uh last summer there were lots of phone calls from again, like I said, mutuals. Uh like some some of those same stragglers called today oh. after this story oh. came out. But there were mutuals who called me last summer because of my current life change and were like, well, you should think about this and don't stress yourself out and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, what the hell? Like, what does it have to do with um, getting this straightening? Like, I keep saying, like, what is going on? Like, there are real offenses taking place here. Um, My spirit is unsettled by the things that I'm seeing compared to like we like we can't even set up a a justice fund to like fund smaller orgs or i'm having calls with board members like do you actually believe in xyz and people are telling me one thing but when it comes down to the proposal and the things in paper and putting it in writing no one no one's nowhere to be found because they just had no interest in doing any of the actual community initiatives I was wanting mm-hmm. to do mm-hmm. as a co-founder, as it's my right to do. So um that's that. I mean, it, it was it's almost a uh, that's why I'm saying you found us at the right time. 
because this is like an unburdening of our spirits, even though we have moved on to the next thing and we want to see, not be so invested in like, oh, campaign zero, like we're moving on. But also there is something about someone fundamentally harming you and financially harming other black people who work there Mm -hmm. uh, with no answer, no explanation, no nothing that will upset you if you actually do care about people. And I care about the people that I brought on with me. Um, So it's going to always, that is personal in that part. Like, why would you hurt the people that I bring on? Um, Including one of my homies from back home, like hired him. These people (laughs) didn't ever even let him come near my sphere of work, which is his sphere of work, community access. Like we're we're community organizers. We want to be over here. He's going to help me. They had him doing coding of damn police union contracts. I'm like, this shit, if you're not interested in this naturally, you're not going to get it. So, of course, he's not performing the way you want him to. That's not what we hired him for. And they just fired him in the middle of the damn pandemic. And I'm just like, this is, he lives in New York. You can't just randomly fire somebody and this is their main source of income. Um, So there's just certain things like that that just upset my spirit, having to even when I did get fired and got my severance, paying other people or helping them, you know, lending folks or giving them money to, for, so they could pay their bills and stay afloat while I'm trying to figure out, well, what the fuck am I about to do? Just because mm. I know I have it and it's not going to be no sweat off my back. Let me keep it moving. Um, I'm blessed. You guys going to bless me. and We're going to keep it moving. <laughs> so I just think there is, there has to be some type of, written solution and this is a written solution okay and it's an invitation because it's definitely inviting more um folks to turn their eyes and come ask questions and get their they get their answers as well i know i said final thoughts and i really (laughs) know i said that but i do i must add to whoever listen to this they gotta really want to know the answers. They are. This shit. They they are. <laughs> listen, this is the tea. What you talking about? This is listen. You got you don't you know you listen honestly speaking. You know this is listen. The people they they do listen. Um, mm. two questions. I don't know which order I want to ask them. Okay, I'll start with the first one. I have heard that there have been people from Campaign Zero that has been leaving. There's been like a small mini exodus. People have just been leaving. There's been they've been dropping off leaving oh recently recently oh yeah Mm -hmm. have you spoken with anybody from campaign zero since your departure have you spoke to people (laughs) do you know what's going on over there what's the vibe have you heard anything do people i mean since the story has come out today right has people from campaign zero been like some folks that's been affiliated been like girl you know let me tell you about you know has there been like any people i mean there's been some people I've yes, got some Mr. stuff today. I've got some yes, stuff. The story is coming. To some people, uh, obviously, people after Sam and I left, um, there's a void. Like you can tell mm-hmm. when when the people who care about people leave, you're left with what you know. So and then people stay because this is their again. I'm talking about main sources of income. And folks needing to pay their bills and um, keep themselves afloat. It's a pandemic. And we ain't seen a, a stimulus check in however long. So folks are keeping their jobs while they can. But when the people who advocate for better quality workplace enforcement rules or HR department, just even a damn manual, an employee handbook um, to stop harassment among contractors. You know what I mean? Like when when these people leave, what what do you have? So yeah, I've talked to some people, and um, the main thing that people keep telling me is like, we just we miss you and Sam a lot, mm. and can tell that you guys are gone. And then after today. Yeah, uh, a few of them were told like this is a hit piece, and if you're contacted by anyone else, please let the f- communications firm know. And um, they refer to this piece as a hit piece. 
Yes. Who told him that? Who you think? The same one who was subtweeting you on Twitter. Him. So D-Ray was telling people it was a hit piece? He was telling the campaigns here people it was a hit piece? Yeah. Oh, bless That's what heart. I heard. That's bless what I heard. Heart. Bless his heart. <laughs> Nah, he mm -hmm. no, he gotta know better. He gotta know. I'm like, again, hit pieces would have way more feelings and emotions, and I don't think any credible journalist would actually publish anything with hella emotions in it, like just nothing but feelings. It's not my emotions. So, I've got not my emotions. <laughs> right. You know, I can't how people quote themselves of themselves. I mean, you know, listen, a hit dog will holler. Um, yeah. That that's 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 what I'll say. That's the classiest I can get. A hit dog will holler. You know, he mm -hmm. he had an opportunity to give a quote just like everybody else, and you know, I think I asked everybody the questions. You know, I I I, I did so. You know, yeah. So, so I mean, I hope he, I hope he. You know, he won't say that to me. He hasn't said, I mean, he's been keeping it cute slightly on Twitter. He hasn't said anything on Twitter that, I, I mean, he hasn't said anything about the situation on Twitter. You know, he's been very, you know, retweeting a lot, tweeting a lot of people that has messaged me like, damn, I, this has been a minute since D-Ray has retweeted me. I wonder why he retweeted me today. Then they looked and said, oh, damn, I read your story. That's why he's trying to be nice. Oh yeah, that's what people told me today. I was like, oh, oh, I, I. I'm, I'm gonna tell you uh, one when we get off this, this, this podcast. Oh, you have to. You can't, told you, me you the can't, same today, and I was like, oh, you can't. Sh you can't. Sh okay. Oh no, no, no. no. Oh, understood. 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 Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we can wrap it up here. Thank you for being my special guest. Um, you know, you're living your best Tea life. Time. You said you're living your best life. You, you, you say you. I am. You're happy. It's humble. It's a humble life, but that's good. I don't think I've ever wanted a whole bunch of extravagant shit either. I just want to be able to make a living and um, support myself, support my family, uh, but no, nothing out of out of the ordinary. So. God is good, and what's for me is for me. Absolutely. Um, perfect. So um, thank you so much for um, being my special guest and coming on here. And I I know there'll be more to be talked about online and otherwise. And um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You are very welcome. Thank you, Ernest. Thank you so much. And everyone listening, you know, please check it out. Share. She's here to clear the record, you know, and and as always, be well and be best. Earnestly Speaking is recorded in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and SoundCloud. To stay up to date with the latest on the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mr. Ernest Owens. Use the hashtag Earnestly Speaking to tell me what you thought about this episode and check out my website at ErnestOwens.com. <laughs>